It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Monday, April 17th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is going to try and read between the lines of what the players had to say on Locker Cleanout Day. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> well, they had a lot to say. We're going to talk about it. Plus, it's Monday, so we'll have our nemesis of the week. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, thanks for making us your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash NHL60 and use that code NHL60 for 60% off plus free shipping. And you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest Lockdown Flyers episode when it's available here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, before we dig into Locker Cleanout Day, there were a couple of rumors that arose over the last couple of days. Uh, Darren Drager from Insider Trading said that Danny Breer is basically having open season on the Flyers this offseason. Everybody's on the table. They're going to be super aggressive. And if they can move up in the draft. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can move up a couple spots in the draft. You usually can't move up a ton. And saying you're going to be super aggressive is all great. Um, but it's still going to be hard to make deals. Like that's not going to change the landscape. I'm just glad he's trying. Yeah, I th- I think that's spot on. That it's really good that he's trying to do things. And um, you know, we'll talk about the management situation as the weeks uh, progress. Uh, you know, coming up with this off season. But uh, it seems like he's trying to make it known that he has a plan. And I think that's the important part here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. A part of that management process and search uh, will be hiring a a team president, also hiring a GM for the Phantoms. And it had been sort of rumored that Alan McCauley from, you know, internal on the player development side of things uh, had kind of the lead on, on that position. But it seems like from what has been said elsewhere that, they really are going to do a more comprehensive search and get some out of the box or you know outside the flyer system candidates in. Yeah, that would be good because you know there's a it's a big jump from what Allen's doing now to getting into management to getting into managing uh, a league that you know has certain intricacies and things that you need to know and have to know how it operates and you know that's it takes a little doing. It's not the best league to break into. Yeah, it's a very specific kind of GM role where you have to not only manage your team's most valuable prospects, but you have to find the right AHL guys to to put in around them to give them the biggest chance of success and give the franchise success at winning some games because you right. do have to sell tickets and you know be successful at an AHL level. So it's a pretty complicated role. It is. It's not. It's not simple at all. Yeah. Um, uh, switching gears to the locker clean out day. I think, you know, based on what everybody had to say, there were certainly some trends in in what people's thoughts were. And uh, I think the, the biggest one for me was that Danny Breer just seems to be a lock for the GM job that the way all the players were talking, he's the one they're communicating with, whether it's, you know, contracts or, you know, figuring out whether or not they're going to return or not. And in terms of talking about all of those things, that he's the guy. Yeah, I mean, based on the fact that they didn't close out the season the same day with the players as far as management went, you know, the whole weekend, it kind of leads me to believe that he's the guy too, because otherwise I don't think they would go through all of that. And with him as an interim, I think they would have just let him close it out Sunday. And, you know, we'd have, at least had a better idea of there, you know, if there was a search. So I have to agree with you on that. 
Yeah, it, it seems like that's where it's headed. I think, you know, the other most important thing that came out of it was there was definitely a trend in terms of how the players were talking about John Tortorella. And, you know, I think it, it was a little bit of a mixed bag here where, you know, some guys said that they really knew where they stood with him based on, you know, what position they were playing or what line they were on. Um, that it wasn't, you know, a lot of words and talking communication, but they could tell based on whether they were in the lineup or not and and all of that. That was how they learned what their relationship was. Um, a couple of guys did talk with him later, especially the, you know, the younger guys that are on the right path. And um, Scott Lawton talked about that specifically. But it does seem like that John Tortorella, you know, across the board leaves the bulk of his communication to his assistant coaches. And you know, there's pros and cons to that. Yeah, to me, it's mostly cons. I mean, there's a reason a lot of guys are assistants and a, and a reason a lot of times guys are career assistants. And they do a very good job at what they do. But the minute you start over delegating, it does cause problems. Now, granted, it, you know, if, if there are players on the team that sort of like the, well, if it might, he's not saying anything and I'm doing OK, if they like that, that's fine. But there's a lot of other players that do like to know what their coach is thinking and they're not going to know. And then if you're a younger player and John Tortorella hasn't sort of favored you, you're really not going to get to be able to talk to the coach. And so I, I don't really like it at all. Yeah, I, I think it's to me, it's more on the negative side of things with him. I understand why he does it in particular, like that's his bag and that's how he's operated. Uh, right. But I think especially once, you know, it would became clear that this was part of a rebuild, like you really have to get dig more into it uh, with the players, I think. And and if you want to develop leadership and have somebody that you want to name as captain at some point, you got to be communicating with them to see what the pulse of the locker room is. And you're not going to do that unless you have these in-depth conversations. Now, they could be happening behind the scenes and like nobody's talking about it or they're not talking about it in a way that they feel like it's, you know, impactful, but that the conversations are happening and Tortorella is making assessments, um, but they don't see it as those kind of meetings, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, the media is not even allowed to talk about who will be a captain since there won't be one next year either. So uh, all of that's kind of moot. It, it's just at the end of the day, I think sometimes, players uh, would like to be able to be more open about things. And it would be nice if you didn't always have to have a cipher to kind of figure out what they were saying. But, you know, then there were some that like Kevin Hayes, if we get into it. He was, yeah, you know, he, he was lost in the second half and, you know, was that all on his part? No. I mean, it, you know, the coach could have helped that situation a little bit and apparently didn't. Yeah, I think that when the the guys were playing well, like and those that were playing well consistency, things were, you know, things were good. But when they weren't, I think it was very tumultuous. And that's what we've known about John Tortorella throughout yeah. his career, that that's just how he operates. And it's very clear who's in the doghouse based on who he's talking to and who he's not talking to. And, you know, again, I think it's going to be a really interesting aspect to this rebuild uh, in terms of if if he's building these relationships with these young guys and uh, uh, maybe maybe that's a good thing because he'll just only work with the guys that are part of the core going forward and maybe it's a bad thing because you need some vets so I think this is a TBD like I would not evaluate John Tortorella as a coach based on this year well luckily you don't have to he's got a previous history that's very long and right now he's sticking to everything he's done in every other place so I I I grade him accordingly, which is, you know, he hasn't changed. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, one thing uh, on a, a lighter note that was very apparent is that everybody loves Justin Braun and is very sad to see him be leaving the NHL, that everybody just even without being prompted uh, brought him up and what a leader he was. And, uh, you know, Cam York talked about him being his first D partner and how appreciative he was. And, uh, you know, just everybody had good things to say. Yeah. I mean, he did everything as far as his body would take him. You know, he always gave his all he played in any 
uh, situation. You wanted him to in a position, basically, <laughs> that you wanted him to. Yeah. He probably would have played center if someone asked him. So, I mean, just the fact that he was up for anything and was always good with young players, he'll be missed. Yeah, I, I think so, too. All right. We are going to continue to talk about some of the overall takeaways as well as dig into what a few of the individual players have to say coming up next. Today's episode episode is brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. Spring is here, and you may be trying to get back into a more healthy and active lifestyle. What better to pair with some new exercise habits than a daily dose of nutritional insurance in the form of AG1? With one delicious scoop of AG1 and a glass of water each day, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all those things. It's also lifestyle friendly when you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything, while still tasting good and supporting better sleep quality, recovery, recovery, mental clarity, and alertness. Right now, it's time to reclaim and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition to make it easy. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs. With your first purchase, all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. So getting back into locker clean out day and what we learned, I think, you know, the other uh, big thing for me is that it was very clear that everyone's impressed with Owen Tippett, Morgan Frost and Noah Cates, that uh, obviously, but besides those guys talking about themselves, <laughs> I think yeah, um, everybody else uh, brought them up. Um, even, you know, Sean Couturier brought it up. Uh, the, in watching the games, you know, he's excited to get a chance to play with those guys uh, moving forward. Well, for me, that's a dream sequence because I don't know what I'm going to see out of Sean Couturier. So I have no ac- expectations of what he might be able to do next year. He's going to have to prove it to me. And, you know, the one thing about Cates is um, I know people are sort of thinking that he's sort of like a Sean Couturier ish kind of player. And, and there's a big difference, a big offensive difference. Like, Couturier was a big, big scorer in juniors and then started playing defensively first and then points started to come. But he's also a bigger, more physical guy. There's going to be a limitation, a ceiling that Noah Cates will hit scoring wise. And he's never going to surpass someone like Konechny. So, you know, that ceiling is under what Travis Konechny would do most seasons. So, yes, that's a good player. And for now, that's fine. Um, But if Couturier gets to be a top line talent, you actually want him to play with someone better than Noah Cates and Frost is a guy who has a higher ceiling even offensively than Cates and that's more suitable and even then you still want someone even higher than that if you can if you really want to be a contending team to be fair. Sure but if you're just looking at these guys in a vacuum of what the Flyers were this year all of them performed very well overall and they all made progress over the course of the season. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, especially man, Morgan Frost toward the end of the season really kicked it into gear. And I think there's a confidence, not just from himself, but in terms of the players around him, have huge faith in him and and what he can do. Yeah, no question. Um, Just one thing that sort of gets me though, is like, you know, John Toro was talking the other day and was saying how he wants people to stay in town And not everybody's going to stay in town. Like Wade Allison's not staying in town. And why should he? He doesn't even know if he's going to get signed, right? So um, I I totally get it from his perspective. But just the idea that if you were going to have guys stay in town, then please tell me or show me some better coaching so they don't keep making the same mistakes. Because some are, you know, while Owen Tippett had a really good year and his best year, there's so much more that could be tapped into there. But, you know, again, a lot of the same mistakes from last year. I don't want to see that repetition again next year. Like these are things the coaching staff and the GM have to work on. And you can't just go with the coaches you have. Sometimes you have to hire people from the outside and let them come in and do their thing. Or even just tell the player, you need to go get one. And here's a list of, you know, some suitable ones that are being used around the league or go ask some of your buddies. But, you know, again, people like Claude Giroux, Eric Carlson, some of the bigger names in hockey have done that and have made nice jumps. 
you need to do that. You can't just sit on your laurels and say, well, we have everything that's that's right here. It's nice for John to say that, but it's not true. Yeah, I think it's different for each guy, like depending on what they have to work mm -hmm. on. I think, it, you know, there's pros and cons to them staying and, and leaving. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I uh, Noah Kate said he's definitely going back to Minnesota. I think that'll be good. And he has a method he does with Jackson in their offseason training. And I wouldn't want to change that, you know, no. just for the sake of having it. There's a bunch of talented Florida. guys out there who'd be scrimmaging with like Minnesota's yeah. loaded with them. Exactly. So I think I think that's fair. So um, and, and I think guys are going to do what they're going to do. Nobody's telling them they have to. So I, I think. No, but when a coach go. strongly suggests that you've got to be pretty comfortable in what you're doing to say, you know, I appreciate a coach, but I'm not going to because if something goes wrong, the coach is going to point right to that. That's yeah. the risk. Um, I do want to dig into Cam Atkinson and Sean Couturier and what they had to say a little bit more just because they were the guys that weren't there. Um, I think, you know, with Cam Atkinson, the issue was the health care, right? And what diagnosis he was getting and that there was like a lot of, you know, tumultuous action going on behind the scenes in terms of getting him the right diagnosis and the right uh, procedure, you know, remember he went back to Columbus to see other people. But when, once he finally decided on the surgery, uh, he said like that when he came back and was doing rehab that, you know, the new staff here, he has full confidence in what they were doing in terms of his rehab. But it was probably a good thing while things were in flux with, you know, as the new team was getting put in place that they not be the ones to make that decision. Yeah, the only thing that worried me is he actually went the opposite way of like Eichel and Farabee, where they right. got the artificial discs. He kind of went with the old fashioned way. And there's a limit to what the old fashioned way can do for you in this league. Like it's proven. Yeah. So I do I do worry about that a little bit. And when I saw that, I was a little surprised, to be honest. But I'm sure based on what he was seeing and not having confidence in the staff here, which eventually nobody did and they, they had to make changes. He did what he had to do, but now I, you know, me worrying about if he can come back and what level he comes back is, is to me, is a real concern. Yeah. And which Sean Couturier, I think, you know, there was not much he could say that would be surprising. Obviously, he was disappointed he didn't get into games um, and that he wants to come back. He feels like he's at, you know, pre-training camp level right now so he can spend the rest of the summer continuing to get stronger again and hopefully he can you know come into camp raring to go um but he knows he has a lot to prove and he's going to do what he can and i think at this point we just have to see what happens right yeah no we do i mean if you go and look at a history of back injuries in this league it definitely affects players uh it may not affect him to the point where he can't play anymore but it certainly is going to affect him to the point where, where he was before all these injuries. So that's where you have to kind of just wait and see and see what he is and how many games he can play. And again, he's had no contact, no hockey contact for over a season and a half, really yeah. a little more than that. So you're going to have to ease him into the pool in that. I, I would hope that that's the case. I hope yeah. that the coach doesn't just bring him into training camp, put him into preseason right away and let him start doing that. I think you you still have to ease him in. Yeah, hopefully he gets some good safe scrimmage time over the summer to yes. with some quality players. I think he's a guy that could use that, right? Yeah, for the timing and other things, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, the the guys that won't be back, uh JVR obviously, um you know, it was kind of bittersweet hearing what he had to say that, you know, he was disappointed he didn't get moved at the trade deadline uh, to get a chance. But at the same time, you know, these this is his family. He's been here for a, a large percentage of his career. And of course, he's going to miss his best friend, Scott Lawton, uh, if he signs somewhere else. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, again, he took a contract and that was the lot that he made. And uh, the problem in this league is if you have a a certain level of contract, usually anything over 5 million and you're not performing close to that, you're going to be on the team that, that signs you. You're not going to be able to get moved. So now he'll have a choice. He can go anywhere. Like he can go anywhere he wants, Rachel. Yep. And if he wants to take a very little bit of money, 
you know, not the minimum, but maybe just slightly over that, he'll have a lot of choices. But if he's looking for bigger money than that, it's going to be a narrow field. Yeah, uh, I definitely hope he lands somewhere that's that's a good spot for him. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as Kevin Hayes goes, I think he was probably the most honest of anybody mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. any of these interviews. And I appreciated that a lot. Uh, Me too. He did defend AV and Chuck quite a bit, <laughs> which was... Well, he's an AV guy. Like, we know yeah, that. And Chuck no, signed them to that deal, so... Yeah, but, you know, everything he was asked in terms of what his, you know, faults were this year and where things went wrong, I thought it was pretty blunt about it. And, you know, he even talked a little bit about the decision for him to play wing versus center and that, um, you know, he, it's very clear that he thinks he's a better center than he is a wing, but he's like, you know, I'll do it. I don't care. Like, um, this is a team sport. This is what you do. But... Um, I think that, you know, he, he was just very clear that he knows there's something wrong. He knows he may not be here next year, but whatever, wherever the chips fall, he'll, he'll be in it because he's a hockey player. Right. But this isn't the best season to move him off of because you want the other oh, team. Yes. You want the other team to think he's a, a second line center and they're going to question that a little bit. Uh, and that is because of the coach. Like, again, second half of the season, he should have played a lot more center. He shouldn't have just played it towards the end where he didn't really have many options. And basically, Hayes said so, and I agree with him. Like, there was no reason not to. Now, is that to say Hayes was playing uh, the way Torts wanted every game? No, he wasn't. He wasn't even playing the way I wanted him to every game. And I don't know what causes that, you know. But, again, he had, like he said, a lot of ups and downs. And there were a lot of times he was just kind of floating out there. Like we know that, but end of the day, you had to also think about, Hey, um, I got to move this guy. And if I got to move him, he's, he's worth a lot more as a center than he is as a winger. Cause he's got three more years at over 7 million per chances are the flyers will have to eat some of that contract for at least the first couple of years and not get a lot back in return. Those are things that you have to weigh that out. Now, even if you're super aggressive, you have to decide because the Flyers need players, don't have a lot of cap space. And, you know, so it's like, how much money are you willing to eat? Because this is going to be dead money for the next two years. Plus, you have other things to fill. There's like four RFAs and three UFA spots. Now you're creating another UFA spot. So that's, you know, you're only getting like a million extra on the cap. So this is not the easiest offseason to trade him. And no, I'm not going to be I shocked if, if he's there when we come back. I would not either. I think this is one of the big issues that Danny Breer is going to have to deal with this off season. Um, there's a couple more things we want to touch on in terms of special teams and, and the way the guys talked about it. Oh yeah. They talked about special teams. Did they? They did. And, uh, and what Tony D'Angelo had to say, we'll do that and have our nemesis of the week coming up next. All right, Russ. So we know, as we've talked about this season, and the Flyers know that the power play was not good. <laughs> stinks. Over... The word yeah. is stink. <laughs> yeah. You can't get any lower. It's the worst. It is pretty terrible. But I think uh, the two guys that talked about it the most uh, were Scott Lawton and Tony D'Angelo. And to uh, Scott Lawton talked about both the power play and the penalty kill. And he talked about like the good things that happened with the penalty kill, but he was very honest that it kind of dropped off toward the end of the season. Um, and that that's definitely something they need to work on as a team to figure out how to keep that more consistent. Um, as far as the power play goes, I think, you know, and, and this was something that I mentioned a, a couple of times over the course of the season is that the personnel consistency uh, was something that a couple of guys talked about in terms of building a quality power play that, um, you know, the reason why the Caps have such a strong power play. Now you have Alex Ovechkin. That is clear. They all know that. But they've had the same, you know, power play unit for so many years that they just know how to get it done. Mm -hmm. And that the way that Torts was rewarding guys with power play time kept the power play from getting consistent. And that's something well, that Tony D'Angelo said. Now, you know. But that's really he, Rocky Thompson with Torts yeah. watching over his shoulder. Like, that's that's what it is, well, right? But if Torts is saying you have to put so-and-so in because 
of this, then Rocky Thompson just has to do it, right? Right. But that's a so part of I, the job. Here, here's yeah. what I would, you know, with Tony. Uh, didn't hit the net enough when he was shooting, for sure. No. Uh, and he was didn't pretty uh, honest about that, that yeah. he, his shooting was not as good. Yeah, definitely wasn't. Uh, zone entries. Like, other than Morgan Frost, maybe a little Noah Cates, once at a blue moon tip it, nobody was good on that team with zone entries on the uh, on the power play. And if you can't get into the zone cleanly, you're never going to have a good power play. So to me, they have to figure that out. They have to figure out who the number one guy is that's going to bring the puck up. And forget the slingshot. Just keep it simple here. Figure out the number one guy. Figure out the number two guy. And then once in a while, if someone sees a play, like Tippett sees something or whatever, Sandheim will see something, he happens to be on the second one, fine. Then go for it. But that was ugly, trying to figure that out. And they had a whole season to figure that out and never could. And that's what right. worries me. And that's what worries me about bringing the same coaching staff back. Because if they all of a sudden say on Monday, there's not going to be any changes, but don't worry, there's going to be personnel change. Listen, we lived through all that. AV brought back the exact same coaching staff and he just swapped their what they were doing and it did, it did no better, if you remember. You actually mm -hmm. have to have some change here, in my estimation. Yeah, I, and I think part of it is like a guy like Cam York, right? He was very also very clear that you know, he has some things he needs to work on. I thought he was very self-aware. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he talked about playing on the right versus playing on the left and what he learned mm -hmm. from that. And um, he almost forgets how to play on the left now that he played so much on the right. Yeah, see, but, that's a, but that's he, another you know, issue. That's that's right. Torts' issue there because you got a kid there that actually had a decent season playing on the right side. But now when he was playing on the right side, did that affect his shot on the power play? Maybe it did. Maybe it affects the way he sees it. And he wasn't hitting the net very much. He had what, one goal and, and he didn't hit the net enough. And you kind of wonder now, is, is Torts taking that out of his game because he needed a right side defenseman and he was the, the guinea pig? I, that's what I don't like. Right. And I think that's part of it too, with the consistency issue of the personnel yes. and where they are placed in the power play. And I think, you know, for him, the big focus with Torts was his aggressiveness on the on the play, and when you're focused on that and not doing your bread and butter of the power play, that's where the power play comes into issue. Yeah. So yeah, no I question. I think overall most of the guys were pretty forthcoming with what they have to work on. Um, and Carter Hart their... was a little like, well, that's um, quiet. That's, that was worried. That's where I was going next when I said okay. most of the guys. Okay, sorry. Whereas I think the the final thought was about Carter Hart and that he was very dodgy on saying anything negative, very diplomatic on the Sam Merson versus Feeler Sandstrom issue. Um, you know, when he was asked about some specific things, uh, you know, that may be wrong or like what was going on with his game, he you know, diverted to talking about the team a lot. And so oh, I feel like he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> like he Which just is bad. Which is bad. Yeah. Because here, here's the thing. We know the coach said positive things about him at the end of the season. We know. Yeah. And I feel positively of... about him. Like, no, I'm and not, we all I'm do. A, we all yeah, do. I just think he's afraid and doesn't know what to say. But we don't know if he fits in. That's the problem because now we're going to go into this off season and with the hockey Canada stuff unresolved, the flyers are not going to offer him an extension, not until that's resolved. And then they may let that pass. Right. So they're going to most likely they're going to let this season pass and either try and do it in season or at the end of season where he's going into that last year of his contract. That's a risky thing when technically you don't have another goalie close to his capability in sight. And this is, for me, a little bit of a worry. I would have liked him to be a little more comfortable and kind of fit in a little bit more with what he was saying. And now it kind of looks like, yeah, he's he knows how to play here and he knows how to survive the coach. But is he fully comfortable? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And I think we'll dig more into this tomorrow when we mm -hmm. talk about what Torts and what Danny Breer has to say, because I think 
you know, especially with what Carter Hart said, and I want to dig into more of what Tony D'Angelo said, as well as Wade Allison and a couple of the other guys, but with the full context of the Tortorella side of the conversation, because uh, I think there'll be a little bit more truth and depth to it. So we're going to absolutely dig into that tomorrow um, for our nemesis of the week. Last week, uh, we talked about uh, the thought of Chicago getting Bedard. Uh, they wound up in the three spot, so we'll see how that goes. Um, they've got an 11.5% chance to win that lottery. Uh, for me this week, it's the uh, both sides of watching playoff hockey. I love playoff hockey. It's my favorite thing in sports is at the NHL playoffs. I think there's nothing like it. Uh, the Flyers are not in it, so it's, you know, it's still tough when your team's not in it. But uh, I'm still very excited to to see how this season plays out. So my nemesis is going to be um, how reluctant will the Flyers be to add any extra talent to their draft table? Uh, when Pittsburgh got rid of Chris Pryor, you know, as their assistant GM, he is a tremendous hockey scout. I mean, you could go through mm -hmm. the last, you know, whatever it was, 10 years that he was with the Flyers and how many players made it to the NHL that were – you know, in his group. And they're not all his choices. I had to point out to someone that Sam Moran was Jack McAlarkey's choice. And once in a while, you have to defer and let one of your guys pick it if they're, if they're yelling that loud for the player. And so right. he did that. So it's not all going to be perfect. But my point is... Well, he he's available got, now. <laughs> he's available. And he could be there as a consultant at the table. And my point is, you can't have too much knowledge at the table. Because for one thing... He's going to bring over some things that he learned with Pittsburgh, but he's also going to, you know, see how his guys have developed and maybe give you insight that you haven't heard in a couple of years since he's been gone about some of the players you have and some of the players you might have been looking at the last year or two. It's just good business to do that. Try and get them. Now, maybe Pittsburgh won't allow it, but you have to try. And I would try. Yeah, he's the one guy that I would consider bringing back and just on a consultant basis for the draft. That's, yeah, you know, or maybe some player development co consultation. But other than that, I, I wouldn't want him to be a permanent assistant GM. That's for sure. No, no, not assistant GM. But if you yeah. want to beef him up in the scouting department uh, and yeah. he wants to do that again, all by all yeah. means, I can't think of too many better guys, honestly. Yeah, I absolutely agree. All right, that will do it for today's show. Thanks for making us your first listen today. And if you're a listener every day, tomorrow on the show, we will talk about that Briere and Torts season postmortem. And we're going to dig into the Phantoms end of season and preview their playoff run. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. If you've got bailbag questions, you can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers, email us at Lockdown Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at rmiriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Have a great day, everyone.